my name is uh, Jeff Salingo. I was one of the uh, team members on this project, and I welcome you back after lunch. This panel is going to talk about research faculty and forging partnerships. Uh, and I think faculty we touched on a couple of times uh, this morning and the role faculty uh, play in, in forming the next generation uh, university. And joining me for this panel is uh, John Cavanaugh, president and CEO of the Consortium of Universities of the Washington Metropolitan Area and previous to this uh, was chancellor of the Pennsylvania State System. Uh, Michael Crow, uh, president of Arizona State University and Luis Perenza, who's president of the University of, of Akron. So, the fact we could probably talk this entire panel about the faculty, <laughs> so we might as well start there. Um, and and there was a couple of questions that came up this morning about the faculty mindset. Um, and I think that there's this belief in terms of change right now in higher education and how the faculty are kind of holding that back. Right? It's it's kind of the administration versus faculty, which of course has been true for generations, but even more so today. Uh, and I think examples in the recent weeks of faculty at some institutions basically saying that injections of technology at their institutions, whether it's in Cal State or whether it's at Amherst, are not going to work. So what, what role does the faculty play in the next generation university? And obviously they're going to play a critical role. But most importantly, how do you as leaders um, kind of bring them in as, as partners. What, what, what does work in terms of bringing them in as, as partners? And Michael, I'll start with you and then move back. Well, I mean, I think the faculty are the <coughs> essential ingredient. They are the, they are the knowledge <laughs> creators, knowledge synthesizers, knowledge analyzers, knowledge transfer agents, the creators of the learning environments. They're the individuals who we ask to be this, these, in a sense, live interactive repositories. Uh, of knowledge, and so they are at the center of all things. What's, I think, important going forward, at least one way that we've approached things, is to <clears throat> not allow the center of all things to become overly uh, egotistical about their role and their purpose. That is, if, if you have a faculty and it's a fantastic faculty and you want them to be successful and you want to avoid uh, conflicts as you move through periods of change, then <clears throat> you engage for a purpose. You don't engage as managers. We don't manage faculty. They're not, they're, 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 that's not the right concept. It's not the right mechanism or tool. What you do is you, you find these self-guided, highly driven individuals who are capable of high levels of creativity and you empower them toward an objective. Now, if you give them a generic objective, as is the case in many public universities, a just sort of a generic objective, then they can act uh, somewhat as mercenaries moving from school to school. They can lose track of their purpose. They can lose track of their identity. But if you give them a specific focused objective, and that objective is the improvement of our society measured in ways in which you can see it, feel it, smell it, count it, you know, all those things, then people get very excited about that. So our basic approach at ASU has been, you know, heavy, heavy faculty engagement and faculty ownership of, of where we're headed. What we've tried to do is to create an environment that allows them to be as creative as possible and for, you know, not without exception, but, but principally we have avoided faculty conflicts. Mm -hmm. Of the 70 or so major academic changes that we've made in terms of the structure of the university, of the new institutes, the new programs, the new initiatives, all of those things, the faculty have been uh, partners in designing those things and have ultimately been endorsers of those things. John, you just uh, came from, uh, from Pennsylvania, which on top of, of overseeing this large state system, also has a unionized faculty as well. Right. Uh, so it's not just shared governance, but it's also kind of the unionized uh, portion of this as well. Again, how do you bring faculty in as partners on, on change? Well, first I want to pick up a, a little bit on, on what Michael was saying. Um, if you think about the socialization of, of individuals who become faculty, you know, we're socialized to be very independent, to be very creative, and to be very skeptical. That's, that's how we're trained through graduate school and, 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 and so on. Um, particularly, you know, those of us who were steeped in the scientific method, you don't just, just willy-nilly accept everything that comes down the pike. I mean, you need some evidence to support it, and you go through the hypothesis testing and all of that. 
knowing that, if, it, if what you then do is to say, well, you just have to trust us. Like, like my, it, you can't manage people who are trained to be skeptics and trained to be independent thinkers, right? So if you're willing to engage on, on that level and, and to remember that perhaps that's the way you were socialized, then it becomes a much easier conversation to have because you know the language and you know the, the healthy skepticism that people are going to come to the table with. That, um, you know, history is full of, of examples of, of people just knee-jerking and, and going down and turning out to be wrong. Right? So the fact that people want to see evidence is actually a good thing. So let's help create the evidence and, and to create that. Also playing into the creativity and the independence bit, if you give people to room to maneuver, and there's a lot of conversation about that, letting people run um, with ideas um, and, and try things out and, let, and get back together and, and share those ideas. That's also part of the, of the culture. And in, in <clears throat> you raised the union issue. And I want to separate out um, faculty and unions um, because unions are structures. Um, organizations that have their own culture and faculty even though they may be covered by union rules and so on may or may not be active members of the union so to use stereotypic notions that it's the union or the faculty is probably going to do a disservice to both so I think if you if you approach it from the from the perspective of understand the culture um, change is not something that that's easily done although um, if we jump out of higher ed for a moment, um, you know, what, what also crosses my mind is how much our society has changed and how much we've been able to change people's behavior um, in, in our lifetime in very fundamental ways. Uh, we now have entire societies that take out their own trash, pump their own gas. Um, you, you, you know, just a few years ago, <clears throat> Everybody who went to the grocery store, um, you had a, a person at the register and somebody putting the stuff in the bag. Now you do that all yourself too. So Very are we, subtle. Are we going to be teaching ourselves? Is that the <laughs> yes. in, 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 in a way, um, we're kind of there with self-paced right. and we can, we can talk a little. But you know, there, there are ways that very subtly you can get broad acceptance of deep change in behavior very rapidly if you, if you meet people on, on their terms. I think the same, the same holds with faculty too. But that's part of the problem. I mean, all, these, all this discussion of, of efficiency makes the faculty think you're trying to replace them uh, or reduce their roles, in, at least in some ways. Uh, please. Well, that's certainly one of the frightening experiences that, uh, that faculty are experiencing. But actually, I think faculty roles that are changing in and of themselves. We're increasingly attracting faculty, whether it's in the sciences, where the change is almost complete, mm -hmm. uh, but even in the social sciences and humanities, uh, you're seeing much more of uh, uh, faculty who want to be engaged, want to be uh, very much connected. And so we built, uh, and, and Michael is, uh, is right, uh, uh, an approach uh, based on three principles, uh, because people want to be relevant, they want to be connected, uh, and they want to be productive. Uh, they don't want to hear that something is academic, meaning that that's irrelevant. Mm -hmm. uh, they don't want to be hearing that uh, you know, you're an ivory tower uh, and therefore no, both unconnected and, and irrelevant. Uh, they, they want to be engaged. And so what we've done is to really create a series of opportunities of a variety of sorts, typically in partnerships with the primary uh, industrial clusters in Northeast Ohio, uh, with other um, agencies, for example, et cetera, to create those opportunities that would not have been possible by ourselves. Mm -hmm. And that generates a whole amount of, a huge amount of interest on the part of the faculty. They, they get excited, they, get, they want to participate, they don't want to be left out. So I'd say that that relevance, connectivity, and productivity element is increasingly being manifested in and of itself. Michael, you talked a little bit about the focused objective earlier. Um, you know, a lot of faculty that I meet seem very interested in their discipline. And sometimes I wonder if the whole institution kind of fell down around them, whether they would care as much as, as long as their department, as long as their discipline, uh, you know, continue to, to survive. How do you get the faculty interested in kind of, you know, serving students, student success, and these institutional goals over the goals of their own school, department, discipline? So the, the approach that we're taking is uh, brutal honesty. 
Uh, and so the brutal honesty is, uh, here's the students we have. Here's what uh, most models predict they should be able to do. They come from this broad cross-section of families. Uh, we're underperforming. Here's what your discipline is doing around the country, whatever that happens to be. Here's what you're doing. You're underperforming or overperforming or performing. And so brutal honesty is a powerful uh, tonic for getting people focused on a certain kind of objective. And then, then when, they, when, when faculty realize that they will be supported to move in the direction of enhancing performance, they move in the direction of enhancing uh, performance. And so they, these are individuals who, for the most part, they, uh, you have to understand the psychology of faculty. So the principal motivation for faculty is not money, mm -hmm. as it is in, in many sectors of our economy. So it you turns, can't just pay them off. It, it, it turns out that it's recognition. Right. Mm -hmm. yes. Recognition is the, is the objective. What did I do? What was I able to achieve? What does my name mean? Was I able to advance fundamental knowledge or fundamental understanding? Or did I, did I create a new uh, uh, methodology for creating conductors that no one else has ever developed before? And if I have done that, then I have achieved something, which is why I devoted me, the faculty member, all that time and energy to doing that. And so when, when, when we talk about efficiency and effectiveness, we don't have arguments with our faculty because we're talking about that in the context of our performance relative to our students. There are no measurements of performance effectiveness or efficiency for single faculty members. There's only performance in terms of the, the quality of your knowledge product or the impact of your knowledge product, which is not effectiveness or efficiency. So we, 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 we assign those terms in places where they can be used. We get reaction to that because they want to be, for the, for the public good benefit of our goal, they want to be more effective overall in graduating our students. So we're getting that kind of reaction. So what one has to do is, is de-simplify the standard classic model. Oh, it's a union, so it's this, or it's a, mm -hmm. we, don't, we don't have unions, but it's a union, then it's this, or it's the faculty, so it's that. And you even, heard, you even hear this perpetuated in the DC policy dialogue. There's these mm -hmm. assumptive models about what a faculty is or isn't. Mm -hmm. And those would be mostly things talked about that are, are not accurate enough. Mm -hmm. John, you talked earlier about there's this healthy skepticism among the faculty, which is good, right? We want faculty to be uh, healthy skeptics, and, and they want evidence. Do we have enough evidence for them? Or will we ever have enough evidence for them? Um, well, you know, to sidestep the philosophical question, is, is there ever enough? Right. Right. Or do we have enough in terms of, you know, even the I, I, we were talking about today? I think I would reframe that in, into more of, you know, the, the social science model. Is it... Is it sufficient, all right, to 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 draw a reasonable conclusion based on the preponderance of the evidence, okay, um, and or to put it in a, in, a, in a different in, in a different way, um, is is it probable that this is the the better or or, or or a good enough solution, given where we are right now, and I would say in some areas the answer is clearly yes. Because some, some of the things that we're, that we're talking about as innovative, disruptive, the, the, the elements of it and the principles behind it have been around for decades. It's the scalability maybe that's different or it's online now and it wasn't 50 years ago. It was, um, it was talked about in terms of Keller courses, self-paced learning. The labels might have been different. The scale wasn't there. But there's a lot of evidence that has been built up over a long period of time in many of these areas that, that really do um, uh, provide significant support to deal with the, the, the hypothesis testing, if you want to look at it, look at it that way. So I would say, yeah, in, some, in, in, in many respects, there is. Is there a generational difference among the faculty on these issues? I mean, we, we knew, we thought years ago that we would see this massive wave of retirements in higher education among faculty, and we didn't see it, probably because of the economy. And How about we know, the Supreme Court ruling in the 1990s? Right, it was the, right so we no longer have mandatory, mandatory retirement. retirement. How about that? Uh, <laughs> and, uh, and as a result, the, the faculty mm -hmm. on many campuses, especially mm -hmm. the tenured faculty, are aging. Uh, is there a generational divide on campuses um, uh, around the issues that we're talking about today on, on the next generation campus? I think by and large it's also a disciplinary divide. Uh, as I mentioned earlier, I think the social sciences and humanities are not always up to speed in that area. But let's remember that it's also a generational divide at the level of the administration 
Uh, we did a big study in, in Ohio about shared services to support IT. Mm -hmm. The evidence was incontrovertible that we could save probably $100 million among our institutions if we did a shared services model. The institutions rejected it. We had to go to a community college to get the first partner. We've yet to get the second Why one. Why did they reject it? Oh, the, oh, because that might enter into their turf, right? right. It, it might somehow or other give up their trade secrets or it might somehow or other disrupt the efficacy with which they think they do something that, of course, by definition, is in of itself inefficient. Mm -hmm. We talked to earlier in one of the earlier panels about the, the role of universities. Universities have many jobs to do, and one of them is training the future faculty. Uh, this idea, if you're student-centered, uh, do you give up on that role of, of training the, the, the future faculty? Well, it, it presumes that we ever taught faculty to be faculty. I mean, the, mm -hmm. it's sort of something that's simply accepted and moved forward. Uh, rarely do we have a, a university that actually teaches somebody how to teach. Mm -hmm. uh, they may know how to do a little bit of research because they spent time in a laboratory, but I think the notion that we ever taught our students to be faculty is has never been the case. I don't, I don't think student centrism, at least in the way that I use that term. But, but you're mainly talking about, are you mainly talking about undergraduates? When no, no, I mean, a student centric students? means, you know, uh, the purpose of, the, the, reason, the reason I use that term is to juxtapose student centrism from faculty centrism. Mm -hmm. So faculty centrism says that we are basically of the European Middle Ages guild mode. We collect students to pay us money, to pay our faculty so our faculty can do what they want to do, and teaching is one of the means by which they gain assets to do what they really want to do. Not that, not that they, well, it's true. There's, people in the audience can't hear, there's a person laughing. <laughs> <laughs> and so, and so uh, it doesn't mean that people don't want to teach. It, doesn't mean that, it just means they want to do a lot more. Now, if you just switch it and you now say the university is student-centric, that's graduate students, undergraduates, whatever, that means the purpose of the faculty is to assist these students to be empowered as master learners to go forward in their lives in a new kind of way. And it's perhaps overly subtle for folks outside the academy to see, but it's a powerfully yes. changed format. And it, it applies to graduate students as well as to undergraduate students. But there is, in a sense, more sociological and pedagogical flexibility with the undergraduates uh, than with the graduate students because I ask anyone to answer the question, how do you produce a synthetic biologist capable of, of understanding the mechanisms by which a new, previously non-existing life form can be engineered? It's, it's not really a classroom activity. I mean, it's, 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 it's a thing that you learn in the midst of certain individuals working in a way that's very hard to describe. Mm -hmm. And so that's the graduate student's life. And so there's a, a big difference, and we haven't, we haven't really focused on that as much, but it's still student-centric. Mm -hmm. So I want to transition to, to research uh, as part of this panel as well. And, and one of the things I think that surprised the group as we were doing this study is that these institutions, as they've become, or as they're becoming next generation universities and, and really focused on students and focused on teaching, haven't given up on research ambitions. Uh, and this, this kind of false dichotomy that's sometimes set up in higher ed, you could either teach or you could do research, but you can't necessarily do both, uh, as, at least at a large scale, I think was proven uh, to be false in, in, in our study, and that, that all of these institutions, while they were gaining efficiencies on a number of measures, including uh, on teaching, that they've also gained in, in research dollars at the, at, the, at the same time. And all of them have seemed to use research as a way to attract quality, high quality faculty who are part of the overall university mission. So can you talk a little bit about, uh, and all three of you, talk a little bit about how research can be leveraged to attract faculty and, and get faculty buy-in for the larger goals of, of the university. And I'll start with you, Michael. I think there's a, somewhat of a more fundamental question. A few years ago, we had a, one of our uh, student regents in Arizona was arguing about uh, why we uh, needed to do anything other than buy a, uh, a generic calculus textbook and just have that available for the next 50 years because he said nothing had changed in calculus for hundreds of years. So while he was sitting there, I went and looked at the last 12 months advances in calculus, which were dramatic and fundamental. But, but this particular individual would have had to understand even the simplest thing about calculus, to even understand what it meant that the knowledge in calculus, which is driven by research in math and research in calculus, 
is an ongoing, continuously moving forward thing. And so what we have constructed in the design of the institution that, that, that we have uh, and in the design of the institution that we think is essential is that if you're going to be on our faculty, you're going to be advancing knowledge in your subject. Or you're not going to be on the faculty. You're going to be advancing the knowledge in that subject so that you can be a better teacher so that you can create a better learning environment for your students. And that doesn't mean that every university has to do that, but our university bearing the name that, that, we, that, we, that we have, which is Comprehensive Metropolitan Research University, we're not, not going to do that. And so it, it goes to this fundamental thing that a lot of people think, and they're wrong, that, that we know all there is to know. Mm. It's all wrapped up. And, that, and now all we have to do is just teach it. And, and, and you don't need any researchers to be able to do that. There's not a single subject that we have at the university for which that's the case. Not one, including accounting. Uh, there are methodological approaches in accounting that are being derived and advanced and, and, and uh, modeled and calculated because you want different types of outcomes for our society and accounting is a way to get there. And so the, I guess the, the purpose for the research is that it is considered uh, an essential ingredient to the building of a learning environment capable of producing an adaptive learner. Mm -hmm. There's other ways to produce learners, but to produce an adaptive learner, we think that the people that are involved in the actual instruction have to be knowledge creators also in the research pathway for us. So we've gone from 100 million a year in funded research in 02, no funded research in 1980, to 410 will be our number this year that will count on June 30th. Without a medical school, that's a huge number, only a handful of schools in the country have ever achieved that. We're on our way to $700 million a year, and it's not about the money. It's about the intensity of the faculty and what they do, and then the attraction of this broad cross-section of students to a faculty of that caliber, to a learning environment of that type. And so it is the case, as you said, Jeff, that many places think that somehow it's one or the other. It's not one or the other. It's both, but at perhaps different levels of intensity. It's both, but at different levels. Well, and it's also the type of research that you're doing. So at least, could you talk a little bit about, I mean, obviously you're in, in Akron, which is, uh, I don't want to offend Akron, but you know, it's obviously, an uh, it's an industrial city. <laughs> and, and the uh, which, capital of the world. Right. Uh, <laughs> so uh, talk a little bit about the, the research that you're also, there is also this kind of connectiveness to the community and to the region and to the state that's also in, incredibly important. Very much, uh, Jeff. And so the way we've approached this is to say to our faculty, to our community, that we want our students to know how both knowledge is created as well as applied. And it works for us because of the long tradition of having grown up alongside what was the rubber industry is now the polymer industry, which is it, it, huge. And of course, over the years, we've linked to other industrial sectors. Uh, we're doing a major project now with industry and the Department of Defense on, on corrosion, corrosion prevention, mitigation, materials degradation, materials uh, uh, support, et cetera. And what happens as a result of this history and this focus on the major industrial clusters is first that it creates a, a connectivity both for our faculty and for our students so they have a sense of where they might be employed. They, they, they have opportunities for internships and work study and co-ops, et cetera. But it also creates uh, an opportunity for the faculty to engage the students in real world practical problems. And it's phenomenal because that, that, that brings about, it, it creates an intensity of commitment of the faculty to the success of the students. The American Society of Automotive Engineers, which I think many of you know, runs these national competitions in a variety of engineering areas. And the way that our students and faculty have worked together over the years has resulted in our students having more, more awards than any other single institution and more awards than all other uni universities in Ohio combined. And it's just phenomenal because, again, they, they are taking the knowledge that's being developed, exploring how it can be applied to the next generation of solutions in whatever competition and or industry they're working with. It results in a, in a very connected, very relevant, and again, very productive environment. John, how do we ensure, I mean, one of the criticisms is that, uh, you know, a lot of institutions have wanted to become more research-like uh, in terms of their profile. And, and so how do we... How do we make sure that these institutions don't kind of creep into becoming, trying to become major research universities uh, and kind of move beyond what their, their mission is? Where research is important and obviously connected to the community and to the state, but that there is not this mission creep that suddenly 
15 years from now, we have twice as many research universities and not you know, and not the scale of universities we need to educate students? Um, well, I think that presupposes a, a, a number of things. The, the, the first is that there are... I'm a journalist, as I'm supposed to draw. That's oh, okay. <laughs> um, that there are research universities and non-research universities, and I would say there is no such thing as the latter. Right. Right? Which um, I'll agree with, but, but, but there are certain types of research universities. In the, well, the not-for-profit not sector. Right. I, but again, I, w I, I would argue that it's not as simple as it's mission creep. Because, you, because it's an envy of something else. There's also been a fundamental redefinition of the relationship between the rest of the world and universities in research. Um, when I was an under, undergrad, um, there were lots of companies out there that had and paid for huge R&D operations. Okay? Bell Labs, the DuPont Company. Right? Now, that's very different. That relationship is fundamentally different. And universities do a lot more basic research. Um, arguably, than they did simply when I was 18, 19 years old. Um, if that's what we're talking about at a scale that, that's at Arizona State, then I think you can build a case that not everybody's going to be able to build the infrastructure necessary to do that kind of work. Mm -hmm. On the other hand, um, we also ought to, to look at, at the creation of knowledge as such a fundamental building block for a student's experience um, that let's also not overly focus the definition of research on particular disciplines. All right? If we look at it as scholarly activity, research, small r, broad definition, um, that, is, that is the creation of new knowledge, then everybody can engage in, in that. All right? It's not just a wet bench science kind of, of definition. Um, and the kind of, of thinking experience and learning experience that that opens to students, if we're, we really want to create our critical thinkers who are flexible, um, who can deal with um, uh, unforeseen things that happen because not every research project goes as planned, um, how do you deal with uncertainty? How do you figure out what questions to ask? How do you know when? Like your earlier question, when you have enough evidence, all of that goes into that research or scholarship or scholarly endeavor activity. If that's what you mean by research, then every decent institution that you would argue is credible is a research institution at that level. So I think it's more of a scale and the kinds of things you do and, 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 and the infrastructure that that takes and, and so on is different. Okay. Let's do you quickly if we can. Please. Well, so just what I was going to say is that one of the things that we have to be really careful about here is that a lot of people think, and you hear this in a lot of the rhetoric, that, that our job at the university is to produce uh, technically qualified individuals to perform an assigned task mm -hmm. upon departure. No, our job is to produce a person capable of learning anything mm -hmm. and adapting to anything, including their first assignment upon departure. And that's, an ex that's a very different mm -hmm. subjective indicator of, 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 of what we're trying to do. It, peop people want to say, well, you don't need the research because just, just, teach, them, just teach them biology. Yeah, pour in the information right. just, just, Yeah, just, it's, it's, it's like, yeah, it's just like making Kool-Aid or something. Cool, cool, cool. And, and so that's not it. And I'm not trying to make it into some fanciful, strange, bizarre thing that only faculty members can do. It's that the, the, the identity of the university as a university is about being what we use the term knowledge enterprise. We produce knowledge, store knowledge, synthesize knowledge, and transfer knowledge. There are institutions that could do any one of those by itself, but only for a limited time frame. Mm -hmm. Universities are supposed to be institutions capable of doing all of them for a sustained Time but frame. they don't do all of them well. Uh, well, different ones do them in different ways, and there's different ways to do it. Okay. At least you had to point that out. Two areas question. of opportunity for universities where research is concerned. First, the R&D expenditures globally are now exceeding a trillion dollars, with the U.S. increasingly becoming a smaller percentage. The U.S. is about 450 billion presently. Of that 450 billion, universities perform only about 11 percent of that. So. A uh, little brutal honesty that we're not the center of the research university. Okay. Yes, right. But very importantly, of that 11%, only about 5% of that is supported by industry. 
Okay? Mm -hmm. And industry does the most amount of expenditures. So the point is, is twofold. One, there's huge opportunity for us to better connect with the international R&D economy, but within the U.S. for the benefit of our students, for the benefit of, of really opp opportunity growth and, and wealth creation, we have to connect better with industry if we're going to succeed in, in creating Hold the that knowledge. Hold that thought because it's a great transition to our, our industry uh, discussion, which is coming up. But I want to go back to a, a quote that Mark Becker said this morning in, in, the, in the first panel, and he said, the best researchers are the best faculty. Um, and that we perpetuate this myth that they're not. Um, why, why is that? Why are why we... Did, why does the press perpetuate the myth? <laughs> <laughs> it's not always the press. Uh, a lot of other people think that too. So why do we perpetuate that, why do we perpetuate that myth, if, it's, if it is a myth? It's lots of emotions in human beings. Jealousy is one. Uh, this notion that somehow the person that can outperform you in teaching and research Somehow you have to find some way to tear that person down. I mean, there's, there's many, many, many factors as to why myths are perpetuated. And so it is the case, I want to I agree with Mark, that uh, in our case, the number of tremendous researchers that we have that are not great teachers is a handful, less than five. Five uh, people. Five, five individuals. Five individuals. Yes. And, so, and, and it's also been the case at my institution that people that were great researchers that couldn't couldn't uh, teach their brother how to tie their shoe, uh, they're not at our institution anymore. I mean, they failed on the <laughs> teaching uh, pathway, and so they're, so they're gone. And so it, it, it's, it's just interesting. It's, it's, it's often the case that you, know, you get these great scholars who are at the edge of their discipline, and what they want to do is to express it. Now, at the same time, there was a, a kid that I was talking to from from uh, East Coast University uh, near the Charles River in Cambridge, Massachusetts, that, that uh, uh, was uh, trying to be recruited by our chemistry department. And so our chemistry department wanted me to talk to him. So I talked to him, and he, and he says, well, you do a lot of teaching out there. <laughs> and I said, you know, you know why we do that? Uh, we're at a thing called a university. Uh, and so uh, we actually have all the faculty teach. And, so, and he said he didn't know if he could teach more than one class per year and keep up his research. And I said to him, now I was supposed to recruit the guy, I said, then you, come here. <laughs> you, better, you better look around somewhere else because that isn't how we work. And so where uh, did he go? I have no, I no, don't okay. even care. And so, and so, and so <laughs> be, because, because he wanted a different, right. he wanted to do a different thing than we needed done. What we need done at our institution is the way universities used to work but he well, obviously believes that you can't do great research and do great teaching at the same time. And he's probably, I don't know if he's so a good somebody teacher. So somebody had it, somebody had along well, the way I, had it. I would, argue, I would argue though, Jeff, that, that, that there's a continuum of skill sets, right? Some people are better at some things than others. And, and what, what, we, what we need are, are people who can handle both well. There are other settings in which if, you're, if you excel at the, at the research and can't teach your brother how to tie yeah. your shoes, that's perfectly fine because that's not what you're, you're expected to do. Um, and you're not getting paid to do that, right? Yeah, um, yeah, yeah, and, and so, you know, um, I, uh, the, the, whoever is perpetuating right. the myth, right? Um, we have to, to also acknowledge that, that we in higher ed are much less willing to tolerate bad teaching um, than we used to be, um, and I think that's a good thing. Um, and what that, what that results in, I think for all of us, is, is we get the best thinkers and the most creative people doing both. And that is the outstanding um, model um, and, 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 and help that we want for our students. Yeah, the people we post-tenure reviewed out of the institution, that is they had tenure until they lost the privilege of keeping it, uh, it was all over teaching, mm -hmm. all of it. I'm going to bring it back to uh, something that we brought, just brought up on, on partnerships. So as, the, as research becomes more important, as the federal government likely cuts back on its support of, uh, of, of research, at least in some, uh, some areas, these partnerships become incredibly more important. And uh, in, in all the institutions that we saw uh, in this study, re, uh, partnerships were kind of a key component. Um, you know, partnerships between individual campuses within the university, partnerships on research, partnerships on, on student experiences, and, and, and so forth. Um, obviously, it's easy to sign an MOU and, 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 and say we have a partnership with X. What, 
in your feeling, in, when we talk about the next generation university in the future, what, what qualities of a partnership equal success? I'll start with you, Louise. Well, uh, that it goes beyond just saying we have a partnership well, a absolutely. with Absolutely, it has to be a, a mutual gain and, and mutual investment. Uh, much as we talked this morning about scale enabling some things, uh, partnerships, collaborations enable two to do something that one may not be able to do. You leverage each other's resources, you have to two things going forward. It's not easy, there's partnering paranoia, relationship fatigue, and all of these things. But where there is synergy, and this is uh, very vital, uh, there, there is uh, that, uh, that wonderful opportunity that, that becomes an intense relationship. Uh, and again, being connected to the major industrial clusters facilitates that. You have the expertise that can make a partnership work. You have the problems that enables the expertise to be uh, expressed, for example. Let me give you just one example of a tr truly precedent-setting uh, partnership that we just created. A major company in our area had a technology that was stranded within the company. In other words, it was proprietary to themselves. They weren't letting anybody even see it, et cetera. But they realized that as long as they kept it only to themselves, it could never gain economically the value that it could have in other fields of use. Thus, they could retain the proprietary rights for their field of use, but in a partnership, begin to build other field of use opportunities. And so they literally took that technology, brought it over to the university jointly. Now we are continuing to develop it, but through an agreement and a, and a for-profit company, we are now taking that technology and moving it into new fields of use, and it's anticipated that it may have 200 or 300 million dollars of value within five years. Mm -hmm. Okay, my point there is that a stranded technology uh, creates an opportunity for a partnership. Uh, we've also done a lot of work with companies where uh, patents that they have on their shelf, again, stranded in a different ways. They're not going to even use it for their own right. Uh, we've created as many companies from other people's technologies as we have from our own technology. And that's been a fascinating set of opportunities. Does, Michael, does location matter on this? Yeah. It, it, it's interesting that several of the universities in our study are in kind of very dynamic metropolitan areas right now. You know, Phoenix, Atlanta, Southern California. You know Dallas uh, area. I mean, what what does that say about the future of institutions like, the like in, in Ohio or Pennsylvania? I mean, is is does location is location how much is location going to matter in terms of these partnerships in the future? Location always matters. I mean, every institution exists within both a local ecosystem for innovation and right. development, as well as a regional ecosystem, as well. So does that mean we're going to see a geographic divide here then among the institutions that are located in No, I, the way not. that I look at it is that uh, we could rattle off for the rest of the day, if you want, all the unsolved things that we don't yet have solutions for in social systems, economic systems, physical systems, biological systems, health care, whatever the list is. That is, the number of things which require new knowledge still exceeds the availability of that knowledge. And so what that means then is what we don't yet have is we is is, is that we, we have not yet figured out how to work in all the levels and in all the ways that we should. And so I don't see location as being anything other than important, but not exclusive. Mm -hmm. That is, uh, you can be in Akron, Ohio, and develop uh, techniques and mechanisms and tools that can affect the whole world, while at the same time helping Akron, Ohio, to be successful. One of the things that Luis said that I think is really important, this trillion dollar number is really important, that's a massive knowledge producing enterprise called research and technology development. If you look only at the people necessary to drive that enterprise forward on a global basis, of which American research universities are a principal, are one of the main, if not the main, producer for that enterprise, it's, it's a remarkable feat to produce fresh, new, capable thinkers into a research enterprise on a global scale, large enough just to meet the demands of the problems that we're trying to solve. And, and those problems, again, they're, they, they go way beyond. I mean, if anything, we're pikers. We're tiny, we're actually underbuilt uh, globally to actually well, so solve So that's a problems. question for any, uh, all three of you. Are, are the expectations now too high on, on colleges and universities in terms, of, uh, in terms of research, especially when we see the public disinvestment at the state level, uh, coming probably at the federal level, especially around research? You talked a lot about how uh, companies don't do the, the amount of R&D that they used to do. Now, Kind of it's, is everyone turning to the university at a time when, uh, when your resources are more constrained than ever well, before? I, I want to come at this from a, a, a couple of ways. One, yeah, the, the expectations on universities are greater than they used to be. Are they too high? Probably not. 
Um, if, if we say we're in the business of knowledge creation is one of the things that we're doing, then we put the expectation on ourselves to some degree. But back to the, to, to the issue of, of knowing where you are and, and what kind of, of research, for example, really fits there. Um, you, you know the geography of, of Pennsylvania as, as well as anybody. And, and there are some pretty rural places where there are universities in Pennsylvania. A lot of them. <laughs> a lot of them, OK. Center County. Yeah. Well, I yeah, <laughs> no, well, yeah. It's, it's in the middle of the state, right? Yes. Mm -hmm. um, but again, uh, just one example, um, East Strasburg University. Uh, not exactly a big metropolitan area. Uh, but it had one of the most successful outcomes of research in, in Pennsylvania, including that, that institution in Center County or Pittsburgh <laughs> or wherever. Um, We're talking about Penn State. Penn State. Pittsburgh, yeah, University Pittsburgh. of Pittsburgh, <laughs> in case anyone's wondering. Um, an outcome of that research was it was a technique uh, to identify whether or not a tick that bit you has Lyme's disease before you ever show symptoms. Why does that matter? Because East Strasburg is right near the Delaware Water Gap. It's a very out outdoors, rural area. Lyme's disease is a very, is a very big problem in that, in, in that part of the world. They're doing research on an issue that confronts that location. So connecting the local. Connecting to the local. Didn't take a lot of, of, of big infrastructure, big cash infusion. Huge positive outcome. So yes, the expectations are high. But if you look at where you are, and, and what are the needs of that area? What resources can you bring to bear on, on, on the, the issue? That's only one of, of hundreds, of, if not thousands, of examples around the country of incredibly positive outcomes that takes all of that in, into account that deeply in, in, involved the student because it was a, in fact, it was a graduate student who fell upon and, 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 and discovered this. So it all comes together. At, at the scale or in, in the way that's appropriate for that institution at that place, looking at the resources that are available to it. And you can build that research infrastructure without impacting your push on student success and, and focus on it, student it, success. You can do I, both at well, the same I would time. Argue, I would argue you build it on to, on, as part of the, the focus on. Because you're integrating you're with integrating the undergraduate in, research. And absolutely. So okay. now, the, what, what you have, and, and John is alluding to this, and that is there's different ways to uh, to do this. Uh, so so uh, Bowdoin College, a college I was a trustee of, I was on the Academic Affairs Committee. I read all the tenure cases while I was a trustee. There's no graduate students there and essentially very little, if any, funded research. And these were fantastic scholars. These mm -hmm. people were working on problems that they could advance as a way of creating knowledge at the scale of an undergraduate institution. And they're using their undergraduate students to do it as well. Yeah, and so it's fantastic. Now, now preparing it, them to become graduate yes, students or whatever. Yes, right? and so, and so it, it really is the case that if you're a fully functioning knowledge enterprise, not a purveyor of information, uh, but a fully functioning knowledge enterprise, you're going to be involved in producing new knowledge at some level and scaling that into your mm -hmm. teaching, learning, and discovery environment. Now, a few of those institutions are also asked, well, could you, at Penn State, uh, they were asked right at, the, right at the beginning of World War II, American torpedoes were failing, uh, and they weren't sinking the enemy targets they were hitting. They would hit the target and wouldn't explode. So there was a lab set up at Penn State that exists today, 70 years later, called the Applied Research Laboratory that, among other things, created a whole new torpedo technology. Now, who do you go to to do that? When, you, when we wanted to split the atom in 1942, they were there with scientists from universities all over the United States and all over the world under the stadium at the University of Chicago so that they could split that item. atom. Who do you go to? Because some geeks somewhere in some academic institution said, you know what, I think I can split these atoms and I can make this stuff happen. And, and there's only that class of institution in all of Western civilization has ever been able to do that kind of thing. So some schools are going to be asked to do that kind of stuff, and some are going to, and the others are going to be asked to keep knowledge alive as an active knowledge creation alive as an active way of producing a better next generation adaptive thinker. It's not either or; it's scale. And I want to talk about other types of partnerships, but I want to open it up to the audience in about two minutes. So uh, if you have a question. Uh, raise your hand and we'll get a microphone to you. Partnerships are not all about research, though, no. uh, right. because it's also about partnerships to do some of the things that we were talking about this morning. Personalized learning, 
uh, using technology in terms of, uh, of building student success models. And we're we're, like we're training engineering faculty members in Vietnam for our American corporate partner called Intel. Sure. Because yeah. they asked us to do it. And we're training the next generation of the oil industry in Saudi Arabia. Right. How about that? <laughs> Uh, questions from the uh, from the audience. Silence. <laughs> yes, in the back. Thanks, Jeff. Uh, my name is Tom Talk. I'm with the Carnegie Foundation for the Advancement of Teaching, and we've been talking in this session uh, largely about uh, the research function of universities and the role of faculty in that work, um, but. Much of the focus uh, at New America and elsewhere uh, now is on how to provide a, uh, an economically uh, affordable uh, undergraduate education to a broad range of students through vehicles, uh, technology, and others uh, that uh, substantially reduce the cost. There seems thus some tension between that goal and our conversation, the, and the sort of assumptions underlying our conversation this afternoon, uh, that is, uh, how do you reconcile the, the infrastructure needs uh, that you alluded to, the uh, full-time faculty costs and the like, to provide a, a research function on the one hand and uh, create a, an economical, efficient, time-effective undergraduate education for many for the many people who can increasingly not afford higher education than the other. Yeah, so it's a good hypothesis. Uh, and so uh, the, the way that we've attacked it, and it does manifest itself in the way that you suggest, I think in some schools, is to look into the past. And what we saw at great research universities of 40 years ago was uh, very substantial teaching loads for the faculty, as, as well as very high mm -hmm. research expectations for the same faculty. And so, We've decided, at least in our particular case, that worked then, it can work again. And so what, what we've decided is to use technology to enhance the projectiveness <laughs> of our faculty, to enable our faculty to do research, to empower our faculty to do research, and not reduce their teaching. Uh, and so we have uh, uh, basically a mechanism where all faculty involved in the institution have to earn 100 <laughs> points of effort outcome. Either they've done a certain amount of research and have a certain number of graduate students or a certain number of online students or a certain number of face-to-face -face undergraduate students. And so if research is going up, they might teach slightly less but not much less. If, if their research is going down, their teaching will go up uh, dramatically. And we, and we operate on this sort of scale on an ongoing basis so that all the faculty are pulling the oars of the, of the boat evenly. Uh, now that's not true at a lot of institutions, but it is true at the particular way that we've designed our institution to avoid the problem that you're talking about. At the same time, we don't want to say that, that and nor is it the case, that the research activity is driving up the cost of the institution. Uh, it's not driving up the cost of the institution if you can get maximum creativity and maximum effort out of your faculty and the teams that support the faculty. But Michael, isn't it driving up cost of institution if, if institutions are using tuition dollars to kind of push their their research agenda because they're not getting it from other entities. Yeah, but it's, 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 because it is, because now remember, it is remember there's a fundamental premise. And so the, the, I don't want anybody teaching biology that doesn't know how to create new knowledge in biology. I just don't even want it. I mean, it's, it's that, that, that person would be outmoded so rapidly. It's the scale of the research. And so there's lots of ways to stay fresh and stay constant and advance knowledge in biology. And a few people, can, can go off into whole new areas and have research groups of 100 people and so forth. Those research groups, that's nature takes its course. Either you get that funding or you don't. And if you don't, at least in our institution, then you're going to teach more than you would be teaching uh, otherwise. And that's not true at some, at some places. And again, the question kind of presupposes a bifurcation between teaching and research. But as we've, as we've talked um, the, this afternoon, the two can be far more integrated than, than people sometimes want to give credit. Um, and that's the scale that, that Michael was just talking about. Um, you know, the, the high end stuff, it's, it's if you get the money, you get it. If you don't, you don't. But the rest of it needs to be, the two need to be integrated and thought of as two sides of the same coin. In fact, if you design the institution correctly, you can do massive amounts of research and not make any investment beyond uh, uh, just the faculty member themselves and the generic tools mm -hmm. that support the faculty member. And you can get a lot done a lot just done. in that. Right. I, I think the point being made is that really by bringing all of these elements together of a comprehensive research university, 
you are able to do more things more effectively than you could if you tried to do them only alone or uh, obviously uh, try to do everything. So the other point that may be uh, worth remembering, and, and uh, you asked a policy question earlier, Jeff, is twofold. Number one, uh, few people realize that research is itself an industry that brings significant wealth to a community that creates additional wealth and creates jobs in the process. And that would be an opportunity to really link the university better to policy. The second piece is that within most public research universities, 85% of the students or thereabouts stay within a 35 to 55 mile region, uh, uh, radius. And, and thus, the better that you are at connecting those uh, students and faculty with the dominant industrial clusters of the area, the more effective that you will be ultimately in succeeding in that in that economy. So part, part of it's a state of mind. I just want to follow on John's point. So, so, so recently everybody's heard about the fact that you know, you've got a hundred times the individual microorganisms living in your body than, yeah. you, than you have cells. There are a hundred times the number of cells of organisms living in and on your body. Now, that's a fundamental research discovery that's come over many, many years. The, that, that can alter your entire view of what is a human. What are we? Where are we? What are we biologically? How do we evolve? What are these species? There are thousands, if not hundreds of thousands, of small learning creative research projects that, that fact the members at every college that's a knowledge enterprise, every university that's a knowledge enterprise, will put to that new conceptualization yeah that 10 years ago did not exist. That's an example of how that works. The new Copernicus uh, yes. moment. Mm -hmm. yeah. Other questions from the audience? Yes, right here in the front. Sure. Um, oh, OK. Uh, Steve Dubb, uh, Democracy Collaborative, University of Maryland. Um, one topic that, that hasn't come up too much on, on this panel is the role of uh, universities in community economic development, obviously related to research, and of course there's the University Park Alliance in Akron. But I was wondering if, if the panelists wanted to address sort of how um, they see the university being reluctant, um, re university being connected to uh, efforts in terms of improving community economic outcomes. Sure. Uh, let me start. Uh, Economic development today is a much broader discipline, if you wish, than most people think of it. In fact, uh, I would argue that most chambers of commerce are obsolete because they practice only one mode of economic development. That's trying to steal something from California or Arizona or Pennsylvania or whatever. Uh, so uh, the opportunity to really see the university as a broad-based and very robust platform for engaging with the community and creating economic opportunity is an entirely new model. And if that is embraced, you all of a sudden begin to have an array of tools at your disposal uh, that is simply not being expressed in many parts around the country. So focusing on that opportunity of engaging every discipline, if you wish, taking the, the land grant model and applying it not just to agriculture and engineering, but to every fundamental discipline, uh, interdisciplinary, uh, and focused obviously on, on uh, the opportunities. It gives you an array of tools from simply realigning the assets in the community in more productive ways to of course the traditional licensing and commercialization to strategic partnerships to uh, investment funds, uh, partnerships with other colleges, with other uh, universities creating women-based entrepreneurial groups, student-based entrepreneurial groups, international partnerships such as Michael and I mentioned earlier. In short, all of a sudden you have a true economic development ecosystem that is embracing all of the best practices that have come from various regions of the country as well as from various parts of the world. So part of the design of the institution as a knowledge enterprise, particularly a, a heavy-duty knowledge enterprise, that is you're producing knowledge at many levels, including large-scale or very impactful, probable discoveries, inventions, or what have you. Our principal, our product index is our number one product is people. 18,400 graduates last year, which has an unbelievable impact in Arizona and Southern California, where most of our uh, graduates go, but even more broadly than that. Our second most significant product is ideas, and we're engaged with, right now, we estimate uh, uh, slightly more than a thousand corporate entities in formal idea exchanges uh, that have meaning and impact. And then the last thing that we produce are uh, gizmos, 
uh, you know, like think of them like phasers or ray guns or whatever, whatever, whatever anybody <laughs> can 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 think up. And so uh, uh, we've got a lot of that going on. Also, we've organized ourselves. We've even done away with the vice president for research. We have a senior vice president for knowledge enterprise development. His associate vice presidents. One is for economic affairs. That office is, is engaged in every corporate retention and attraction. Uh, activity of any scale in, in central Phoenix, which is a, we live in the third most populated county in the United States, four million people in Maricopa County alone. That's a lot of things that are going on. We have another officer who's responsible for innovation and entrepreneurship. We have an innovation and entrepreneurship campus. We have a learning by doing engineering campus. And I'll just top it off with this last thing that we're building, which is a thing being paid for by the city of Chandler, which is one of the suburbs of uh, Phoenix, which happens also to have big Intel plants and orbital sciences and a range of other companies that are there. We're building a 24 by 7, 365 day a year innovation center where any citizen can come in and build whatever it is that they need to build to start their company. Co-populated with students that are building tools, devices, and outcomes that are related to the starting of their companies. And so this is, this is uh, uh, an innovation center at scale in, in this particular community that's going to have a huge impact on that community. And I'm just giving you, because of time constraints, Five examples of 500. Let's go to the other end of the spectrum for just a minute. And then we'll get the two other questions. Let's suppose you have a university of about 5,000 students, biggest employer in a five or six county area. All right, you're in the middle of nowhere. How does that play out? Um, well, suppose further that the second and third biggest employers manufacturing plants close. Okay. You now can play an, an enormous role in that community by <clears throat> working on job training, Opening, in, opening a, an incubator, which we did in Clarion, Pennsylvania. It's right down I-80 from, right. from Louise. Um, because all of those communities need small business. So the campus then becomes the center for the small business development centers or whatever they, they go by in your state. So even at the, at the more micro level, you can have an enormous role on the economy of the region, even by helping, uh, you know, uh, sort of the classic mom and pop set up a business plan for a grocery store, oil change business, um, you know, something to support the Marcellus gas industry, whatever it happens to be. So even at the small level, um, you, know, you don't have to be in Maricopa County, but by taking an active role in helping people develop business plans, get loans, how do you apply for loans, how do you get a credit rating, all of that other kind of thing that help people get a start can have a, a big ripple effect um, on, on a community. Question over here. <clears throat> All of your um, excitement for your partnerships, your corporate partnerships, um, I've had the fortune to read hundreds of grant applications to the Department of Education, mostly for low-income pro programs to help low-income first-generation students. They're not well-written. There's not a vision, there's not excitement, there's a lot of discussion of need. They're coming from a lot of the same institutions that have these exciting partnerships in these wonderful offices. Why are the kind of projects that we're hearing about not getting the same kind of attention and having the same kind of vision? Well, I don't know the answer to that specifically. I know that we, we and this is not meant to be uh, defensive, it sort of depends who submits them and sort of how they evolve. And so it might be, it might be the case that uh, uh, a, a group from the community comes to the university and they identify a single faculty member. The single faculty member then looks like the university, but that single faculty member doesn't even speak to the university. The only time the university sees the proposal is on the way out. And so for us, just to put that into perspective, that's 3,000 proposals a year. So you can get some sense of the complexity of it. So one of the things that I've said to uh, Secretary Duncan on two occasions is, that the Department of Education would be better off attempting to work at the institutional level mm -hmm. with the leadership of the institutions, right. and maybe they do in some cases, right. but as opposed to working with individual centers, institutes, faculty members, and so forth, because what happens in some of these things, the, the Intel Corporation, we have an institutional relationship with, and we have uh, individual faculty relationships with the Intel Corporation. The same with the Boeing Corporation and the General Dynamics Corporation and, and so forth. And so with the Department of Education, we have no institutional relationship. None. 
what we have are proposals that are going in, some of which we know about, some of which we don't know about. So there might be a way to upscale those to the quality that you're looking for if we could figure out how to build institutional relationships. Now, I might be overgeneralizing, but I know in our case, that would be helpful to us. I think that's right. I couldn't agree more in terms of, um, you know, if an announcement comes out to individual faculty members, they throw stuff over to Transom, and, and sometimes it doesn't even go through the sponsored research yeah. office before we find it. out about it. We <laughs> never hear about it until word of mouth comes back or, or some institutional letter of rejection or acceptance or whatever comes back. But so that institutional relationship is really critical. Yeah, question right here in the aisle. <clears throat> Jim Snyder, a former New America fellow and currently a fellow at the Edmund J. Safra Center for Ethics at that institution across from the uh, Charles River. Yes, I didn't mention I didn't mention which one. But. <laughs> yeah. right. uh, my question concerns uh, the downsides uh, downside of these uh, research partnerships. We primarily here just looked at the positive side of such uh, relationships. I was last week at the. Third, uh, uh, third World International Conference on Research Integrity in Montreal. It had more than 500 academics there, only a small fraction from the United States. And one of the prime concerns there uh, are the downsides of these uh, external relationships. A large fraction of them are medical researchers because pharmaceuticals. Are, right. Yeah. Uh, but there were a lot of people from engineering departments and other scientific departments. Uh, uh, and uh, there was a feeling that uh, this goal of uh, enhancing knowledge, moving it forward, was often in conflict with these external relationships. A uh, tremendous number of um, unreported conflicts of interest, maybe like think tanks here in Washington, D.C., mm -hmm. that have all these, all this research and there's often hidden agendas you don't know about and that's come to universities. So there's a lot of concern with this and there's an argument that it's actually becoming an increasing problem uh, and maybe related to the fact that there are more of these relationships that are sanctioned. So my question is, uh, you know, what are you doing to deal with the downsides of, of these relationships, and do you think there's significant numbers of faculty that now have their priorities distorted in some fundamental yeah, so way as a result of these incentives? Well, I, one, I think you're bringing up a very important problem, and I agree that there's a problem particularly in biomedically oriented research where the, the uh, not only there, but, but it's uh, highly uh, concentrated in that particular sector. When I was the senior research officer at Columbia Un University for 12 years, uh, we were facing a number of these issues over and over in our Conflict of Interest Committee was meeting repeatedly over and over and over, but uh, I don't think that we've gotten a, uh, to deal with the issue, but I don't think we've gotten a, a, a grasp on it yet. I also think that universities are insufficiently uh, punitive to uh, people that uh, violate the, the common trust that you're supposed to be an objective researcher, and I think that transparency and everything at the 100% level is required for these things to work, and we do not, we do not have that yet. Uh, because people are afraid of being punished. Uh, I don't know if it's because they're afraid of being punished. It's, it's like I'll read that somebody cheated on all their data and they got fired. I'm like, they got fired? How about fined or imprisoned? Right. Uh, because they took public money and, and cheated on these things. And so, and so, yeah, I'm in agreement. And we're, we're not where we need to be. And we do have to be alert to that. In our particular case, we don't have a, a medical school, so we have fewer issues. But we, uh, we have very strict rules of engagement relative to our work with, uh, with industry, and we probably should be ever vigilant to make certain that we don't compromise our own identity. Uh, we're running a, go ahead right there, and Thank then you. we'll go to the last very question. Very quickly, important points. Disclosure uh, makes it possible to manage conflicts. But let me take briefly a very contrarian position. I think we've sort of defined ourselves into a corner of conflicts of interest instead of thinking about possibilities of synergies of interest. Uh, a former colleague of mine once said, no conflict, no interest, no interest, no commitment, no commitment, no results. Uh, question in the back. James Sang, we've been talking about partnerships, and I have a question about the rules that ILOs uh, for state universities work on, in particular, how do they choose between uh, the best local home for technology and the best home period for technology. Uh, in terms of transferring a technology out? Yeah, basically transferring it to, well, as you, know, as you guys all know, I'm sure there are some people who want free agency from the point of view of licensing. And uh, one argument I've heard against it is the argument that uh, it would kill you guys because it, 
because the technology would no longer be localized. So, most, most of our technologies are commercialized locally. Uh, not all, but most, and we strive for that. Uh, it doesn't always work. Uh, it's, it's, it's an objective, yes. We're very fortunate in that a lot of our technology applies to about 1,800 companies in our region, so we have a, a natural uh, regional and localized opportunity. Uh, but it ultimately depends on where the opportunity is, and it, it may or may not reside locally, depending on what the nature of the technology is. You always, we always try to create the, if you wish, the benefit as close to home as possible, but that may not be possible in some technologies. So I want to uh, end on a, on, a, on a question that kind of ties all th the three of these areas uh, together. Uh, a couple of weeks ago, I was out at the Arizona Innovation Summit, which used to be on uh, at Sky Song, but it's gotten too big. So the one on educational technology. Educational yeah. technology, right? And um, you know, there's a lot of companies now in this space of trying to help both K through 12 and higher ed on student learning. Um, you know, many of them obviously for-profit uh, companies. Michael, you talked in the earlier uh, session about eAdvisor, which you guys created mm -hmm. internally. Obviously, then you work with Newton, which is a for-profit company and a partnership. Mm -hmm. Why, we have all this research capacity at colleges and universities on, on everything from data to pedagogy to student learning. Why, why do we see all these external companies trying to help solve your problems? In terms, of, uh, in terms of student learning, student success, whether it's advising, financial aid, uh, personalized learning, why are we not seeing universities kind of trying to figure this out themselves? Why aren't we seeing more yeah. e-advisor types of things? You, you, it all depends when you take the snapshot. So if you took the snapshot pre-internet, you'd see it operating mm -hmm. inside a bunch right. of universities, and now you see it and you think that uh, you know, uh, Apple and all these guys are all so geniuses cool. that just created this stuff out of whole cloth or from heaven or whatever. And so it turns out that there's these processes. So it just, it's when you take the snapshot. So adaptive learning technologies like that from Newton, Newton didn't create that all by themselves. There were inputs from universities, inputs from ideas, literature, ideas, software, code, and then they shaped it, materialized it, marketed it, built relationships with us. We have tools that we're developing in our Institute for Learning Sciences that someday will be commercialized. We have some that we're integrating back into other programs. And so, so it's you think there's enough happening right now within universities in terms of uh, students? Yeah, I'm, student I'm, I'm generally a believer that there's never enough and you okay. can always do better. But, but is there a lot going on? Absolutely. Okay. And a lot of collaborations between university-based researchers uh, and companies. And so what you're going to see, as Michael says, is a process that evolves all of these relationships. Some companies that will win, some universities that will begin to integrate all of this and and bring it home to their students in a much more economical way. Be okay. um, I, I was going to flip it over and say, because if we did it that way, the, the question, in, instead of the one that was asked, would be, why are you duplicating all the effort, and why aren't you um, doing the, the, uh, the, the sort of commercialization or transfer of the, of the, the tech transfer? Out, right. Well, I mean, part of the problem, though, now is right. people think there's a quick buck to be made on, on, on K-12 through and higher ed, and so you oh, see yeah. all these now companies mm -hmm. entering into the field. But that, isn't that always the case? Right. Right? More so now, probably, than ever before, though. Well, yeah, with like, like, like there, there are uh, educational purveyors that are making right. 50 and 70 percent profits. Mm -hmm. It's unbelievable. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Well, with that, uh, we're going to wrap up this session and, uh, and take a, about a five, ten minute break uh, till uh, five of for our next session. Join me in thanking the panel. <laughs>